All right, Peter Matthews, Professor, you're on the line with us. I want to thank you for being with us again. Let me just explain Always to you. Always good to be here, Dave. Always good to be here. Thank you. Peter Matthews, more than three decades, college, university professor. He is professor of political science at Cypress College. He and I worked together on numerous occasions at uh, NBC, and now we're together here. Okay, Professor, you've heard some of my takeoff on Boehner, because really this whole fiscal cliff's already beginning to stink to me. Explain to me what it really means, and then we'll get into how it can be resolved. You know, I heard what you said, and you were absolutely right that this should have been figured out and fixed over a year ago. Instead, the Congress, rather than working things out with the president and getting these the uh, 150, $1.5 $1. trillion reduction over 10 years, they decided to set up a super committee, Dave. Now, what is a super committee? Made up of a few senators and congressmen. They're punting the ball to someone else rather than the whole Congress making the decision together, and yet the, even the super committee could not have reached an agreement by November 21st a year ago. So now we are here a year later, and we are still at the cliff. Now we're, at the, now we're actually at the cliff, and it looks like if they can't get it together and come up with uh, agreements on tax increases and some budget cuts, uh, that's it. Uh, by December 31st, on January 1st, you'll see the uh, cuts uh, right away instituted to, beginning to be instituted in defense spending, about $600 billion for 10 years, and $600 billion more in discretionary programs like education and health and human services. Now, you and I both know, Peter, that this can never happen. You know it. I know it. What is it, a game of chicken again? It is. It's a game of chicken, and the president said he's not going to budge in terms of one particular item. He says that we need to let the tax cuts on the rich, on the super rich people, over uh, $250,000 a year, that income bracket, should those tax cuts have to be canceled, those are the Bush tax cuts on the super wealthy, but the president wants to maintain them on those making less than $250,000 a year, and the Republicans won't have anything to do with it. They want to keep all of those tax cuts in place, including on the rich, and they're playing a game of chicken, really, but the president is adamant that he's not going to give in on that part of it. Okay, so... Because it's just a matter of fairness and also real, not only tax equity, but real economic sense. sense. It makes sense to do what, he, what the president is saying. So who's going to blink in your estimation? Uh, my estimation is that it's going to be, uh, I think I would say the House of Representatives and, and Boehner will probably uh, give in to some extent. They may say, look, we will close some corporate loopholes, but that won't be enough money. So, President, would you agree to allow the wealthy to have a small part of that tax cut that Bush gave them, not all of it? They might do something like that. But I think the president has the upper hand here. He just won a resounding victory with three million more votes than Romney. And he had this on the, right up on the campaign platform at the front of it, that we should make sure the wealthy pay a few percent more in taxes to help the American budget to be balanced and also to invest in education infrastructure. So he put that out there. Romney lost. He won. I think Boehner's got a weaker hand. Wow, that's an interesting analysis. We're going to continue our conversation with Professor Peter Matthews. I want to explore further how much more the market will bear in terms of what's needed and how much these quote-unquote rich, because you see, these days, 250000 mm, it's not like 250000 in my granddaddy's day or my daddy's day. It just isn't. Not in California. That's true. It's a lot more than what we've been seeing before. We're going to keep the conversation going. Peter Matthews, keep it right here. David Cruz, KTLK, AM 1150, your voice. David Cruz, KTLK, AM 1150, your voice. We're speaking with Professor Peter Matthews about this impending fall off the fiscal cliff if we don't do something. I was reading between uh, the last segment and this one, Professor, that uh, the G20, you know, some of the world's leading nations, the industrialized countries, met over the weekend, and they, they were begging U.S. officials attending the meeting to avoid the cliff in 2013. They're saying, look, this could be a tipping point for the world economy. Again, how much of this is showmanship and how much of it is real? It is real, because if you have that kind of, those kinds of cuts that will be put in if we hit the fiscal cliff, in other words, $1.2 trillion in 10 years, that's going to take a huge amount of purchasing power of the economy, and it's also going to bring back the taxes that the Bush era had lowered. It's going to bring back higher taxes on people up and down the ladder, which means more purchasing power taken out of the middle class. I wanted to mention what you mentioned earlier, touch on that, and that is, this proposal of the president only affects the top 2%, incomes over $250,000 a year. 
So under $202,000 a year, they won't be uh, paying any higher taxes out of the president's plan at all. And that's something the president wants both the Republicans and his administration to do right away. He says, if we both agree that we shouldn't raise taxes in January on those making less than 250000 a year, and up to 250000 a year, let's do it right now. Let's pass the tax cuts on them, and then we will work things out afterwards on, the mil- on people making more than $200,000 a year. So this is something the, the G20 is absolutely correct on, that it will take a lot of purchasing power and, and demand out of the American economy, which means we won't be buying the kind of products that Europe produces, that Japan produces, and that can really slow down the whole world economy. So we've got to get this house, fiscal house in order right away, David. There's a couple of other points that I also want to note and discuss with you. One has to do with there is a, there's language within the, um, the credit structure in America that was guaranteeing depositors unlimited insurance for all non-interest-bearing transaction accounts. Here's what I understand that if this TAG, what they call the TAG, the Transaction Account account Guarantee, expires, the prediction is that uninsured deposits, which is about $1.4 trillion, Mm -hmm. will rush into money market funds and seek the safety of short-term U.S. Treasuries. And that's why they're saying when we saw the 320-point dip on Wall Street the day after the election, that is something to take note of. Uh, What do you say to that? I say that's absolutely true, and that's going to cause a rush into the safer deposits and safer investments, which will take money out of the stock market. Which means, again, that people are freezing rather than freeing up money and having it flow into the economy. Exactly. We've got to bring money into the economy to create more demand so that manufacturing will go up, New jobs will be created here, and more export uh, economy will rise from our side. And I wanted to just mention one more thing here. You know, under Bill Clinton, these rates that President Obama is uh, uh, demanding, the 35% to be raised to 39.6%, it was under Bill Clinton that folks making over a quarter of a million dollars a year were paying those higher rates. And I wanted to say something else. Those making a million dollars a year under the Bush tax cuts received $100,000 extra for 10 years per year in their pockets. Whereas the middle class... Peter, Peter, slow down, off. slow down. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're not living in the days of Bill Clinton. Come on, come on. Listen, Peter, yeah, the in the interest... Growing. Well, but in the interest of transparency, okay. most of the stuff that we buy now is made overseas. It's not being made here in America. I remember those days. Peter, look, I have <laughs> friends in small business who were prospering. They were manufacturers. They were traders. They were doing things, moving commerce back and forth. My brother... This is a different world. Here's my point. We have become a consumer nation. We're not a production nation anymore. I mean, That's or at right. least... That's, that is a major problem. We've got to re- reverse that. The, the German economy is an export-based manufacturing economy, and we need to move in that direction so we can export more than we import. And you know what, Dave? We can do it if we educate our students and get them into high-technology jobs, new careers, and also put investment into infrastructure and new kinds of... For example, President Obama wants to put in investment in green technology and to bring in new things like solar panel production that are for export markets like China. I would agree with you, except that the barons of industry today, the GEs of the world, see it very simple. They may live here. They may have recreation here. They have their homes in the Hamptons here, but in other parts of the world, but they have no allegiance to this country. They're, they're exporting jobs as quickly as they can and machinery. I understand what you're saying. So we get our kids into high tech. We get them into biotech. We get them into health. We do the kinds of things you're describing. My, my skepticism and where I'm stuck, Professor, is how do we bring these barons back to America, do you really think it's all about simple taxation decisions? Because it could be that you're absolutely right. If you lower taxes instead of raising them, maybe that brings them back. I don't know if that's what you said. Well, that's, that's only part saying. of the equation. It is true that we give them incentives to come back. There you go. But we also punish them from just leaving. We don't give them subsidies to take their factories, shut them down here, and take them to Indonesia. Yep. Yep. And yep. That's what we've been doing. So yep. we do that, but also you've got to make sure that our people are educated for the new 21st century jobs. And, you know, I'm an educator, and I can see that. My students are on the floor trying to get into my classes, 20 or 30 on the floor, and when there are 75 seats only in the classroom and they're full. So we have got to make sure we have technical education. We've got to have apprenticeship programs, things that the German economy has been doing all along. You know, and they're just, uh, I mean, not, not, it's not perfect in Europe because of the Greek problem and all that, but Germany is a great example of an export economy that 
had an industrial policy. We've got to work on industrial policy here, meaning get the government involved to some extent in promoting the businesses that create jobs here and create new types of jobs and support them with educational opportunities. The government has a role to play. And the voters voted for that, Dave. President Obama was very clear on that. And I think that's the only way we can do and compete with other countries like India and China, which, by the way, are producing even more engineers than we are, much more per year. You know, what do you think that. about this? What do you think about this? You know, look, a second term, fresh eyes on Latin America, fresh eyes in our relations with Canada. Do you think that a hemispheric strategy would make sense for us now? You know, Europe has yeah. had an effort to unify Europe. Do you think that if we were to, again, look for ways to innovate and bring us all together in this hemisphere. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense because we have a lot of things in common. We have the same time zone in the hemisphere, more or less, and we can have manufacturing more efficient that way. And we have a uh, common language. We speak Spanish here and also across uh, Mexico and South America, and, England, and Canada speaks English like us. Mm. So there's a lot of commonalities. We should work with an with a America trade zone that brings in fair trade, not just free trade, but we have to have fair trade where labor standards are raised more equitably across the board. So the Mexican workers have to have higher wages gradually, not matching ours exactly yet, but on the way to it, like the Europeans did when they integrated their southern part of Europe with the northern part in the common market. That worked very well because once the Mexican workers have more money in their hands, when they're paid more by foreign corporations and international corporations, they'll have more money to buy more exports from us and demand an export economy from here. So that's the it's a fair Professor, trade. yeah, uh, I love your passion and we're out of time. But listen, I want you to help us track this path to the fiscal cliff and help us avert it. Absolutely. I'll Even if it isn't the last second. Thank you. Professor Peter Matthews from uh, Cypress College, an old colleague of mine, a young colleague of mine, but certainly a man with a lot of wisdom. And we'll continue with you.